Good morning, everybody. I'm pleasure to be today and to have a discussion with you about learning analytics. I'm going to talk today about learning analytics, the new emerging field. Uh, many people are discussing it. I believe many people are just associating, associating it with technology, purely a technology. What I want to do is today is I want to make a case that learning analytics are not just a technology, but they are spanning much more, and they are going into the ports of many different aspects of education and learning we are interested in. So I want to just start with a brief reminder of many things that probably most of the people in this room are aware of about the current educational landscape. We are aware about the growing needs for education. We are also aware that we are uh, more and more asked to educate or work with non-traditional learners, learners who are at least part-time employed, or learners who have some dependents, learners who don't have their entire uh, age from 18 to 22 to spend on campuses, or they are doing some part-time jobs or supporting their families. At the same time, with a growing need for education, we are experiencing a large number of uh, students who are entering into our education, thus big classrooms. We are also trying to see how we can reduce time for many students to complete their degrees, or at the same time, to reduce some of the waiting lists to make sure that students get the right courses that they need to enroll to complete either degrees, certificates, or to get their education they are interested in. So this, of course, lead, uh, leads us to some questions related to learning at scale and trying to uh, scale up some of the existing educational models. It is not just that we are talking about MOOCs that uh, had a big hype in the 2012, but we are also talking about different alternatives, alternative models of education, whether we are talking about, for example, models such as competency-based education. In any case, we are talking about different models that are trying to scale up education. Another important, and I think equally or even more important part of the educational landscape is efforts to increase the level of activity of students or to in, uh, facilitate students to become more active in their learning. And we are seeing many efforts in that aspect where we are trying to increase uh, the efforts towards flipped classrooms or active learning initiatives. We are also seeing there are some promising results, but at the same time to facilitate both increased uh, need for education and also increase the level of activity of our, our students. With a growing number of students, we really are quite often turning uh, to technology as one of the potential rescues in that process. However, the moment we are introducing technology, especially at the large scale, what happens is that we are uh, pretty much decreasing the feedback loops that are existing between students and educators, or also between students themselves. Therefore, the question becomes how we can potentially decrease and improve these feedback loops, not only at scale. So this is where we are seeing the role of learning analytics. And I'm now going to briefly introduce the field of learning analytics and what learning analytics aims to do. I will not be using any uh, big, um, I lost the, sync with my slides. Uh, I will not be using any big formulas or algorithms, but rather I want to just explain the basic principles of learning analytics. The field emerged from the existing needs or existing reality that we are collecting many data points about our learners through different systems and technologies that have been around in our educational systems for a while. Some of these technologies are quite familiar to this group of people, learning management systems and student information systems. Uh, inside of these systems, we are also trying to uh, incorporate other types of technologies that are commonly used on our campuses or they are trying to increase the level of engagement or perhaps to uh, help students to increase their communication skills through different social media, to increase their information seeking skills through different search engines, to increase their uh, reflectivity levels through the use of different blogging technologies and other types of collaborative technologies. What is important in this process is to remember is no matter what we do with these technologies, we are creating digital footprints. And the field of learning analytics aims to make use of these digital footprints that we are leaving when we are interacting with this technology and other users of these technologies, apply some machine learning and data mining algorithms, then use these results of the data mining algorithms and then try to develop some visualized 
presentation for our learners and provide feedback for both learners and educators as part of that process. Or if we are looking at that process more formally, the Society for Learning Analytics Research adopted this definition that learning analytics in its what part is trying to achieve is trying to measure, collect, analyze, and report data about learners and more importantly, contexts in which learning happens. At the same time, and I always think that we must not forget and we need to focus much more on the why part of the definition of learning analytics rather than on the what part, what many people are trying to focus on. This what part, why part is much more important because through it, we are trying to increase our understanding of learning and also to increase uh, and optimize learning and the environments in which learning occurs. Okay, so this is, I think, fine, quite formal. So let's see what's really happening and what we have learned so far in the field of learning analytics and what are the some potential case studies from which we can get something out of it. Probably some of the best known examples of the use of analytics in education comes from Purdue University. And at Purdue University, they developed a system which is called Course Signals. This system is exactly based on the model that I just explained. They use their learning management system. In their case, they use Blackboard. They used all these different trace data uh, from the system, and they also use data from student information systems, such as, for example, variables about socioeconomic status of students or other uh, demographic variables about students. Then they use these variables, and then they fed them into a machine learning algorithm, and the output of that machine learning algorithm was a single variable which had three categories. These three categories were students to, uh, at high risk to fail a cur course, students at a moderate risk to fail a course, and finally, students who were not at risk at all. Then they used these three categories they were interested in to translate that into traffic lights. And these traffic lights were then presented to both students and instructors. What they uh, achieved as a consequence of the use of this system was that they managed to uh, increase significantly retention of those students who used, uh, who enrolled at least one course which was, which was using course signals. And over the period of four years through uh, which they uh, tracked a cohort of engineering students, they see significant increases in that uh, retention rates. Those retention rates were in somewhere in the range between 10 to 15 percent across the period of four years. Obviously, this is very interesting, but this is not what I call in principle learning analytics. This is what I call academic analytics. And the authors of this system also call it academic analytics. However, several users try to also consider it maybe it also had some good improvements for learning and for teaching. And as a consequence of this, they conducted a follow-up study at Purdue University in which they tried to look into the messages that instructors send to their students as a consequence of the use of these alerts. What they found is that teaching really didn't improve much at all. What they found is that instructors did increase the level of interaction with their students. However, they were sending them primarily summative feedback, just more frequently. They were hardly sending them many or any instances of formative feedback, and we know that formative feedback is the one which promotes learning and increases also learning outcomes. Therefore, this tells us an important story. We cannot just dump a certain technology in, on our instructors or students and expect the magic will happen. More importantly, we need to build these types of analytics that will also have some feedback for our stakeholders that are uh, feedback information that is actionable, based on which they can take certain actions. And if that feedback is for instructors to improve uh, the learning of their students and for us to, for our instructors to improve their feedback for students, then we need to provide information that will be much more actionable in that process. Another case study comes from the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan took a 
slightly different approach. In their case, they said, well, yes, we have data, and everybody has today data, but we should not be driven by uh, just by the fact that we can use and make use of some of these data. Rather than being data-driven, let's be question-driven. And they were interested to un understand what are those pressing questions at the University of Michigan. They realized that the pressing question in their science education was uh, certain gateway courses, especially for non-major students. And those gateway courses were significantly affecting some of the students, not necessarily to fail the course, because the University of Michigan is one of the top tier research universities, and they also have access to some of the best students. Rather, for them, the challenge was that students who were coming to some of these science courses, and for them, science wasn't the major. For example, students of psychology would enter into some of these uh, compulsory uh, science courses. They would not be getting typically higher grades. So in their process, then once they identify this critical question, then they engaged with the students to understand what type of learning strategies successful students were following. And they, of course, discovered something which is already known in education. But typically, two major characteristics were that students who were more successful, they were more adaptive, in a sense, that when they tried a certain study strategy and encountered that that strategy wouldn't help them, then they would try a different approach. And the second group of students or second group of strategy who were also equally successful, they typically uh, were studying with their peers in that process. So once they collected this feedback, they accumulated this feedback and asked for permission of some of these successful students in the past years to use these uh, tips for their peers in the future generations to provide them with uh, instructions how to study in the future. In addition, they didn't use the measure of retention as their output measure. Rather, they use the measures better than expected and worse than expected with respect to students' individual goals. And then based on that, they develop the whole personalized system which would be sending alerts for students, comparing whether students were doing better in certain classes than expected with respect to their goals that they expressed before taking a course or co as compared to their GPA. In addition to that, they were also providing them certain feedback information based on self-determination theory and also specific instructional advice that they would gauge that would have impact on students. In their particular case, they eventually reported significant gains for students in the overall program, and they also offered a significant, I think, case study which tells us that some of these elements can be addressed if we engage our learners in a way that is built and grounded also in what we already know about learning and teaching. So let's now move on, on to the bigger question, and what is the level of institutional uh, adoption overall? Well, while we have some of these good studies, and I think learning analytics is one uh, among those very much hyped technologies that we can see in the different uh, media reports, we at the same time can also understand that very few institutions in the world have institution-wide adoption of learning analytics. What I mean by this is I'm referring to here the sophistication model that was suggested by the Society of Lear for Learning Analytics Research in the, in the white paper published in late 2013. And that sophistication model involve five different phases that institution are, institutions are initially just aware of learning analytics, that they are doing some preliminary experimentation to just generating certain simple reports, to the point that organizations uh, are offering dashboards at different levels for students, for faculty, for different decision makers inside of institutions, to the point that universities are or institutions completely transform and that particular case, we really mean that we are focused on personalized learning, and with that personalized learning, I really mean providing information for individual that is relevant for them, and also facilitating learning opportunities that are personalized for each individual. At the same time, the final sophistication stage is the entire sector to be transformed. What do you think where we are now, where, where most of the institutions are? They, they are just at the bottom. Most of them are really just in the first phase. Very few are in phase two, and, most of, and also significant proportion is really nowhere on this scale, if we are talking. 
quite often we can just see very few enthusiasts. So in, in a way, if you are looking for a certain narrative, I think this uh, uh, EDUCO's uh, observation is quite true, that interest in analytics is high, but many institutions are, uh, many institutions had yet to make progress beyond basic reporting. And we really have this as a big challenge. So when we are looking at some of these uh, elements is, well, it's fine to identify all these problems, but I also like to tend and to suggest, well, we need to look for solutions and what direction we need to take. And what is that next uh, step forward for all of us in the field of learning analytics? And somebody who, was, who spent almost entire his life in uh, education, uh, then I always had this kind of significant resistance to even have a look at some of these business analytics models that were out there and that were typically used in other sectors, not in the field of learning analytics. But then I started re reading some of the reports and some of the literature that was uh, suggested by the McKinsey and, and company. And they were suggesting a model uh, that is built around three critical points. And I actually, when, once I looked at that model and also got a bit of reinforcement, but also had the pleasure to be on certain panels with individuals who were coming also from the, uh, from the world of business analytics. For example, in Australia, there was one panel on which uh, a person from Deloitte was also on the board. And his main point was, well, we can't really start just from data. We need to start from theory. And to me, that was the point, well, there is something into it that probably we can also learn from the field of uh, business analytics as well. And this uh, model offers some very critical and important points where we need to start from and give us guidance if you want to look from the perspective of learning analytics and general institutional adoption. So let's start from uh, some of these three key points. The model is also simple because I believe it's fairly simple to be presented to anybody else. So in terms of uh, first point with respect to data, there are critical three elements there. The first element is importance to be critical with data sourcing. So we should not be just counting number of page heads. We need to go on beyond that. We also need to think about what are those relevant questions and what are those important social, psychological, and other learning phenomena that are occurring in our learning processes based on which we can get some of these critical questions answered. So for example, one of the things that we are quite often forgetting is that social networks are everywhere. And these social networks can even be extracted by simply going into course registrations and understanding who, uh, who students are taking typically courses with whom. And just based on these cross-class social networks, we can explain almost 25% of students' uh, graduate average point that students are having. So this is an important point that we need to see and we can also understand that students tend to uh, study with students who are like them. So for example, students who are successful in their studying, they are very much likely, about 84%, uh, to take uh, near their future courses with other students who are successful and other students who are not having that high success in their education, they are about 77% more likely to take uh, some of their future courses with the other students who are not uh, also that successful. But to, to join together, there is no statistical significance. Therefore, it is an important data point that we can get and be just with a bit of creative thinking. There's another point. Quite often we can see that different institutions are coming and trying to adopt learning analytics and they are charging just a single unit in their school. For example, quite often that happens either with teaching and learning centers, or in other cases with IT centers. I recently had a chance to be involved in a project in one Canadian university in which their learning and teaching center wanted to promote and engage academics to develop their local learning analytics projects and address some of the relevant questions. But at the same time, when it came to the point of getting access to data, their IT department said no. Regardless of the encouragement of their vice president academic to start with this initiative, simply because IT department felt that was validating whatever their working practices. And so we need to get all our stakeholders on board with these initiatives rather than expect and charge a single unit inside of our institutions. Another important thing with respect to data is that we need to constantly uh, be aware of limitations 
and challenge our existing assumptions. One of these critical assumptions that we are always seeing is like, let's use and measure time, how students spend online. And first, recent research shows that we are highly inaccurate in estimating how much actually students are spending online. And we can use then different strategies to uh, reduce that bias in estimating time on time, but at the same time, we are, when we are looking then at the associations of time spent online with, for example, some of the outcomes that students may have, that may change in the explained variability for almost 15%. Therefore, we need to be very aware of some of these limitations and be also clear what we are measuring and how we are measuring some of these points in data so that we can then be more also able to more accurately or uh, interpret some of the analytics that we have and what we can do out of analytics. The other element of this model that I want to talk about is related to uh, modeling data and using data mining uh, algorithms. Quite often the institutions just think that they need to go and turn to a certain data mining company and they will do the miracle for them without even thinking what questions they have. They typically expect that they will turn to this organization and the data will tell them everything. And quite often, once they turn to such organizations, we end up in a situation where we have these brilliant answers, but we are not sure what our questions were and what problems we wanted to solve. And as a trained computer scientist, I can tell we are brilliantly trained to find solutions, but then we start looking for problems. And so this is one of the critical questions that basically boils down to a next point in the model I'm gonna to touch on in very few moments. So what we want to basically as a part of this process about data modeling and what we want to understand. First and most important thing is this statement that I'm gonna make here, which is I quite often tend to say which, which is a very smart ass statement. Learning analytics are about learning. But we really forget that we don't really think that, uh, and what do we mean with this learning analytics? Well, one critical point is that learning is very contextual. The second thing is that we know so much about learning and teaching, and just because we have now this big new big hammer, we can now uh, hammer whatever we want with it. It doesn't mean that we now all of a sudden need to be divorced from learning and teaching what we know so far, but rather we need to just advance it and embrace it and then empower it with some of these analytics. I'm just going to quickly give two examples what I mean by this and how important it is to build on the existing research and understanding and practice of learning and teaching before we can make something meaningful of our learning analytics. In my research, I quite often come from self-regulated learning research, and I build quite often on the model uh, suggested by Phil Winnie out of Simon Fraser University in Canada. And part of that model builds on uh, one model which is called copies. I'm not going to go into details of that model. Uh, but the first component of that model C stands for conditions. And these conditions can be internal conditions, like for example my uh, prior knowledge, uh, cognitive load, my level of motivation, my study skills, my level of metacognitive uh, awareness, and so on. And it could be external conditions. And external conditions is, for example, just our instructional design and other factors. So based on these models, we really can conclude that we can see in analytics that one size fits all doesn't work in learning analytics at all. When I'm saying this, I'm referring to the lot of debate that we see recently around different predictive models. These predictive models are crunching data and thinking that they can equally be applied to any subject domain in any class or any particular situation. What we are seeing in our research is, for example, that instructional conditions are such a significant moderator of the association, for example, of learning outcomes and the student engagement with learning tools that we are offering uh, with our learning technology and that are used differently in different classes. So when we lump, lump all these data into a single pot of data, we typically see that we can, yes, explain and find some significant associations with learning outcomes, but we typically find associations of those variables based on which we cannot act at all. Those variables are, for example, level, number of logins. Why we are getting these significant variables? Well, because they are the only common across many different courses. However, when we divide these courses and look into the course-specific 
predictive models, then we can find significant associations and we can pin pinned down to the specific relevant tools and trends that can inform teaching practice. And also we can see that in some courses we can explain, for example, almost 75% of the variability in the outcome that students may have, while in other courses we can explain maybe only 1 or 2%, and that's not even significant. And when we turn to the instructors, then we realize in those courses where it's not significant, they tell us, but of course, because we are not using that technology at all. So, we are pretty much having something which is very commonsensical in that particular case. In the other cases, we are seeing the technology is so significantly nicely scaffolded that it can help us to explain some of these outcomes. The other important thing besides instructional conditions is uh, understanding of students' agency. And we often are dealing with this big myth that more time online is better for learning. Well, actually, it's not true. Research is very consistent with that regard. In some cases, of course, it's a, it's a good proxy to perhaps indicate that students are spending significant amount of time online, but it's also potentially a good indicator that students are struggling if they are spending more time. And when we look at the literature, and also when we did all, several other studies, we typically identified that students are uh, fitting into several uh, typically four different strategies that are following with the use of technology. Those that are completely disengaged, they don't bother to use technology. Those that are typically focusing on just the activities that they have to do, and they are very strategic in that. Those who are spending enormous amount of time in the class, and they are not the most successful students at all in the class. And those who are spending, I would say, just the right amount of time online, and they are highly successful students. And of course, students are, and students' strategies are changing from week to week because conditions are also changing from week to week. So please don't confuse these strategies with learning styles. I don't want to go into that discussion. Uh, the final point that I want to make is transform. And if we want to transform our organizations, if we want to develop this data-informed, not data-driven, data-informed culture, we first of all need to create these participatory designs of learning analytics tools, and I would say learning analytics strategies. We saw a good example at the University of Michigan, what happened there and how they approached this whole problem. Another important thing is we should not be expecting that all of a sudden everybody becomes a data scientist. But at the same time, I think it's an important point that we want to make sure that not only that we want to, everybody to become data scientists, but we need to also be uh, careful with respect to what we are presenting to different student populations. One of the things that we will always find in some of these uh, tools that we are having uh, currently available for analytics is that we just want to show some data to our students because why? Well, because we have that data and it's easy to do that. Rather than because we are answering or addressing an important learning questions. And as a part of that problem, what we are typically missing is, well, we are missing to see how our students are interpreting or misinterpreting some of these data. And one nice study was done at the University of Melbourne by Linda Corin and Paula uh, de Barba, and they basically just went with uh, students at the University of Melbourne, and they were looking into their interpretations. And they found that even uh, students who were one of the best achieving students in their classes and students who had very high success rates and expectations in particular courses, when they see that comparison between their own performance and activity with the class average, they felt that they were doing well when they saw that they were just slightly above the average, although they were underperforming with respect to their personal goals. So that, that tells us an important thing that we need to teach our students how to interpret some of these data. And the other important thing is that these data can be harmful even for some of our best students. While for other students who are perhaps not even best achieving students, but rather they are even struggling with their self-efficacy about learning and learning goals, that might be uh, harmful because of other things. When they see they are not doing so well compared to the class average, then that may just reinforce their uh, low self-efficacy beliefs. Another important thing in this process is, 
And this naturally comes out of this uh, point that I had, is development of capabilities to exploit big data. And I don't mean here really just that we need to have more data scientists. I really mean by this that we need to increase and create this uh, data savvy culture because we need to create, even whether we want it or not, whether we want to use analytics or not, analytics is used around us. We are getting so many ads in the process. Data is collected everywhere, and we need to increase that awareness. At the same time, quite often in education, we are building certain decisions or trying to make certain changes just purely based on certain narrative. At the same time, this is a good opportunity for us to embrace data and become aware what can be done through data. And then through different interdisciplinary teams engage with data scientists who need to have good communication skills and then try to address important uh, questions that are of relevance for both our research and practice in education. And the final point about this transformation and importance of the creation of data savvy culture is, well, that's fine, but are we really ready uh, to act on analytics and analytics results? We, for example, find in some uh, studies, and I think in many studies we can find, for example, when we use some of these well-known models that are used in distance and online education, like, for example, uh, Moore's uh, transactional distances. And then we, when we transform interactions of students with, say, different learning management systems towards these three major dimensions, student content, student student, and student instruction, instructor uh, interactions, then what if we find, and this is what we found, is if student-instructor interaction is negatively associated with student learning outcome. And to me, this is not necessarily a bad thing. This doesn't mean that students are getting bad advice from their instructors or having bad things from that interaction. It, to me, it means that we are just addressing and students uh, who are struggling and need more help, they are getting assistance from their instructors. But what about the rest of other students who are perhaps not struggling with respect to our course goals? But perhaps those students need to be more challenged or we need to have different slightly uh, curricula for them that will be addressing their own needs and thus they will be also requiring more assistance as well. But these models are good to implement because let's face it, they are cost effective so that you are dealing with, le few, with fewer students and then you don't need so many instructional time to address some of these questions. Another important thing and that we are also finding in when we are dealing with data is what if we are detecting that students are primarily performance oriented? That is to say that students are primarily dealing with the types of tools that are offered in their learning environments that are just strictly those that are bringing them some points in the final grades. What about other learning opportunities that can be found there? Our studies are showing also that, for example, there is about 30% of students who are just doing those activities bare minimum that we require from them to take so that they get some grade. Is it just a problem in poor decision making on the end of our students? It is also uh, our responsibility as instructional designers that we are creating these learning opportunities for students which will be also increasing their study skills so that they become more aware that certain activities online are good for their also professional future practice and to create out of them good lifelong learners. That's an important question that we need to look. On the other hand, if we have some of these performance oriented students, they're almost 70% likely to stay in that state. While we can change all these other students and perhaps they are also more likely to turn into performance oriented learners. So, what if we are getting results and we are getting of, from our analytics in this way? What do we do? Are we ready to act on them and how we act on them? Those are some of the important questions that we need to deal with. So the question becomes, of course, as a consequence of this, uh, of this, what's our reality with respect to adoption of learning analytics and how our institutions are actually embracing it? So what are some of these challenges? Uh, that are relevant there. We recently conducted a study uh, in Australia. It was funded by, us, by the Australian government. Uh, as part of this study, we had a uh, chance to interview 
uh, the elites of uh, learning and teaching and their learning and, and learning analytics policy in about 32 different universities in Australia. This number needs to be interpreted uh, from the perspective that there are 40 public universities in Australia and they are all major players in that higher ed market. So in addition to that, we also had a chance to interview a cohort of about 30 international experts in the field of learning analytics. We were interested to understand what are those activities that institutions are taking as a part of their learning analytics implementation and also with respect to what we really need to do and what are those learning analytics implementational models that are relevant for this process. As we already saw, all the universities are in these first two phases in Australia, which is in principle a good thing because they are at least in these first two phases. However, when we discussed with most of their vice presidents, or typically in Australia they call them deputy vice chancellors, learning and teaching, or pro-vice chancellors, learning and teaching, they would typically say, yeah, we are aware of analytics, we are experimenting with analytics, and then some magic happens and poof, we are in personalized learning. <laughs> so this is our understanding, what we are seeing with respect to the needs for implementation of learning analytics. Another important thing is, and we found that in some of the interviews, well, some would say, uh, well, we bought this brilliant learning analytics product, learning analytics ticked. And we don't have that problem anymore, so that's not an issue in our institution. Uh, of course, it's not just that we need to blame in this process our decision makers, because let's face it, they are just some of us, academics, who basically turn to take some of these roles. We also identified that many researchers are really not focused so much on scalability of their solutions. While their solutions are good and they are working in particular contexts, how they scale in some other context, or how we identify opportunities that some of their solutions can be applied in some other contexts and situations. So engagement on that front as well is necessary and potentially some of the discussions with respect to design-based research are here real opportunities that we can see some of these questions being addressed. As a result of uh, uh, this process, we came up with this model which indicates some of these critical phases in the implementation or the in, in engagement with analytics that institutions need to take. Obviously, development of strategic capability is so crucial. We need to have some basic level of data literacy on the front of our strategic decision makers institutions. And this is a really important pressing question. Had a chance to work and talk to, uh, I, I think, the only learning analytics specialized organization. Uh, and they are a fast growing company out of uh, Austin, Texas. And what they basically approached us from Solar, they, there was the question that they have so much interest from many institutions, but at the same time, when they start talking to these institutions, they have a difficulty to actually talk to their decision makers because they don't really understand what's learning analytics and what can be done with learning analytics. Their potential customers can and they are willing to use analytics, but they just simply don't know how to use it. Thus, this is the prerequisite for any implementation on the uh, systemic level. Then we need to work on the development of implementational capabilities. We need to talk, think in terms of the resourcing. We also need to think in terms of what we really can do in-house, in what talent, what, uh, uh, what other resources we may have, or whether we need to engage with some external organizations. And on the, an important point in this process is given that we are dealing with analytics, we will use tools, but then do we really want to use randomly tools, or we really want to make sure that some of that, those decisions are both research-informed and also will inform research in the future. And this is one of the critical points because otherwise we may just have a nice story or we embrace this tool, we develop all these capabilities, but what is the rigor of our assessment of the implementational strategies as an important point. All right, just few final remarks. First, an important thing is that we need to embrace complexity of educational systems. We cannot expect that a single node in the network, in the, such a complex network such as higher education will fix all our problems. It may have certain influence in that process, however, 
we need to understand and carefully think what will be the effect of that process and then carefully monitor implementation of strategies of this process. Another important thing, and I'm just reinforcing the point I already made, is necessity of multidisciplinary teams in, institutional, in institutions is critical. Many institutions have their CIOs who are making decisions which technologies they will use. But if there is no collaboration with learning and teaching teams and also faculty and students, then these initiatives are typically doomed not to be successful. Another important thing, and the question that I haven't talked so much today, not because I think it's not important, but I think because it is so much obvious for this audience is importance of ethical and privacy uh, consideration. One important thing, and many institutions typically say, well, we are not going into learning analytics because it's a slippery slope, we are not allowed to use data. My question is, are we developing privacy agency of our students if we are removing their choice to make a decision? What data they can use, we can use or not? How we are developing uh, our students in that process that they are exercising some of that uh, agency? This is an important thing, and this is not just that we are making decisions on students' behalf, and let's not do that because our students don't want to do it. I am the advocate of my students. Uh, GISC, it's an organization in the UK. They just recently published this code of practice. It's a really good resource. A code of practice addresses some of these critical points and considerations that many institutions need to take into account when they are implementing analytics. And uh, it's a really six-pager document. It was built on a very thorough engagement with the entire higher ed sector in the UK. And they also, in addition to this six-pager document, they have also much bigger document, Lit Review, in which they uh, looked into many different uh, existing policies and practices that universities are taking, and also the state-of-the-art literature in learning analytics. So this is a really good document to start from. Final point that I want to make is the so much importance of the development of learning analytics culture. We cannot expect that everybody with their implementational strategy will become all of a sudden Brad Pitt and creating great teams as it was done in Moneyball. We really need to build on our common sense, on our existing learning and teaching practice and research, and quite often on lots of that tacit knowledge that is, that is available in heads of our teachers when they are interrogating or making sense out of some of these analytics. Like it was the case in the trouble with the curve that Clint East, Eastwood played a few years ago. Uh, I suppose that this audience has many Americans. Uh, I had several attempts to follow some baseball matches and I still don't get it what does it mean to be in trouble with the curve, but sounds good and I think appropriate for this audience. And on that note, I want to thank everybody and happy to take your questions in the session following. Thanks very much. <laughs>